Uh, tonight, we had, I don't know, a bit of dancing going on here. We had some singing, which is great because tonight we are starting a new series called More Than a Song. Could everyone say More Than a Song? Excellent, as you can see on the back there. So we're, we're going into a series on worship. Now, when I hear the word worship, my mind kind of straight away just naturally goes to things that happen up here, right? To like someone banging on the drums and someone strumming away at a guitar and then a few people singing quite nicely and then a few people out here also singing nicely and a few people out here singing not so nicely. Um, but we're going into worship tonight. Um, and hopefully by the end of tonight, I'm going to try and throw out a few little puzzle pieces, a few different ideas of what worship might be. So hopefully by the end of the night, we kind of have a fuller, maybe more complete picture of what worship might be. But firstly, um, we're going to talk about lips. Now, is anyone here Greek? Okay, can you, can you yell out how to say the word on screen? The, the one underneath it? Does anyone know how to pronounce that? It's called proskuneo. Proskuneo. Can everyone say proskuneo? Cool. Does anyone know what it means? Something to do with lips, right? Okay. Oh, it's a bit of a hint there. So a hint of where we're going tonight. Proskuneo is the Greek word for worship. Interesting, right? So whenever worship is in those New Testament books that are written in Greek and we can't understand. Whenever it says worship in our Bibles, those Greeks from 2,000 years ago, they were reading proskuneo, right? And what it means is to kiss towards. That is the kind of direct translation. To kiss, use your lips to kiss towards God. Kind of confusing, right? Doesn't really make sense with the way that we kind of think about worship. But I'm going to tell a story, and uh, hopefully by the end of the story, we kind of understand that just because you kiss, it's kind of significant to kiss, but doesn't mean that you actually love someone when you kiss them. All right, that's a bit of a hook. That's where the story's going. All right, here we go. Let's get this going. Who has a crazy teacher at their school? All right, we all have a crazy teacher. Um, I had a teacher... There were room, uh, for some reason, all of the crazy teachers at my school, right, they all had one thing in common, and that was they all enjoyed throwing things. Um, there was a rumor that there was a teacher that got fired from her old school for throwing a baking tray at a student. Um, that was just a rumor. I don't know if it was true. I had a teacher in year 12 who taught special maths, and he was the vice principal, and whenever you didn't do your homework, he would throw all of your belongings out the window, Laptop, books, open pencil case, just throws it out if you don't do your homework. Um, I had a teacher who maybe heard about what was going on in that classroom, wanted to one-up it. He threw a student out the window. I'm not even joking. I witnessed a teacher throw a student out the window. Um, he's no longer teaching anymore. <laughs> um, by choice, though, by choice. Um, but in, um, in primary school... I maybe had the most crazy teacher, right? So she was one of those, um, those drama teachers that's like, kind of, she fit all of the movie stereotypes. Um, she was like, a lot of makeup going on, very exuberant in the way that she presented herself, very friendly, really nice lady. Uh, anyway, she kind of wanted us to be little kids, like little cute primary school kids, but she also wanted us to have a lot of maturity, Right? So whenever she'd put on a production, she'd put on something that was kind of the step above in maturity. So what is the kind of go-to musical if you're in primary school, but she's pretending that we're actually in high school? High school musical, brilliant. So it's kind of obviously she didn't see the kind of irony of primary schoolers doing high school musical. Um, but anyway, that's the way it was. And there were rumours going around the school that there was a scene where Troy kissed Gabriella on the cheek. <gasps> okay, so this is full on, this is full on. The buzz around the primary school was insane, right? And um, this drama teacher heard, heard the rumours, heard the buzz around the school, and she's like, I've got to put an end to this. It's not that big of a deal. I'm going to teach them what it really means to kiss someone. So 
she sits us all down in the classroom. She sits us all down and she says, all right, I've heard that you guys are a bit concerned about the kissing scene, but I just want to say to you, it's not a very big deal. Just because you kiss someone doesn't mean that you love them, doesn't mean you're going to get married to them, doesn't mean you're going to get cooties, right? So we were like, hey, yes, it does, yes, it does. And um, so she's like, she figured out this plan. What she was going to do was pick a boy from the class and pick a girl from the class. And she was going to say to the boy, okay, you must kiss the girl on the cheek and no one is allowed to laugh. Everyone must keep a straight face and just go, this is a normal thing to do. So what happened was, we were all sitting there, we were all nervous. We were like, oh, if this is me, I am not going to hear the end of it. So we're all sitting there. And she goes, who's she going to pick? I saw someone point to me. You're correct. She picked me. I get up in front of class, and my heart's just going, Drrr. I'm like, this is, I'm so nervous. And then she's like, all right, and what girl wants to be kissed? Strange questions were asked, and this girl, Jess, puts her hand up, and she's like, I want to be kissed. And she's like, <laughs> she's like I kid you not. So, no, it's not, a, it's not a story to cheer. And the teacher was like, no, you're not mature enough. And then, um, and then she picks another girl. <laughs> and um, anyway, so Natalie comes up. And immediately, like, as I'm holding her hand, getting ready to kiss her, um, going through my head was like, hang on, I'm a Christian. Like, I'm not allowed to do this. Like, oh, <laughs> what's this going to mean? Like, I wanted to save my kiss for, like, the girl I was going to marry. And, like, my head just started going there. And then, like, the amount of peer pressure that was coming was, like, so intense. Um, so anyway... I kissed her on the cheek and the whole class just went crazy and like the whole demonstration was ruined. But the point was proven, I think, that day that I wasn't into Natalie at all, right? Everyone kind of knew that. I, my heart was not for Natalie, but I still kissed her, right? I still kissed her on the cheek and kissing her was kind of something big-ish, but it, you didn't actually know whether it meant anything to me without knowing what was going on in my heart, does that make sense? That is where we're going tonight. Proskuneo. Just because you kiss towards God sometimes, we don't actually know how much it means without knowing what's going on in your heart. Maybe you've kissed towards God before and it's looked like helping a friend at school. That's kind of kissing towards God. Maybe you've kissed towards God tonight as we've been singing. You've gone, God, I love you. I'm going to sing a song about you. The praise is yours. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's kind of kissing towards God. But we don't actually know what's kind of how meaningful that worship is unless we know what's going on in here. And Jesus speaks into this. He says, these people make a big show of saying the right thing. You can kind of replace the word saying with a few different things. Maybe you could replace it with singing or doing. These people make a big deal of saying the right thing. But their heart isn't in it. They act like they're worshipping me, but they don't mean it. Now, when I hear this, I just kind of think, like, I don't want my life to be the life that is just saying and singing the right thing. I don't want my life to just be, oh, that guy's doing the right thing. He must be worshipping God. I want it to mean something in here. So tonight, if you've ever felt like sometimes you're just going through the motions and you're just saying or doing the right thing, maybe you're worshipping on a Friday night and you're just like, this doesn't actually line up with everything that I'm doing in my life, then tonight's message is for you. And I know I hear, hear a um, verse like this and I kind of get worried, right? Because I hear it and I'm like, if this is me, then that's kind of scary. And I know that when Jesus said things like this, there would have been a whole group of people that have been like, is Jesus talking about me? And how on earth do I make sure that he do if this is about me, that it won't be about me forever? Luckily, we have this dude named Paul, and he wrote into it in Romans 12. And this is where we'll be spending a little bit of time tonight. So if you've got your Bibles, feel free to grab them out to Romans chapter 12. We're starting in verse 1, which is a good place to start, I think. It says, now just remember, we're coming from, we want to know what worship actually means. We don't want to just be saying or singing the right thing. We want to know what it actually means. And Paul speaks into this and he says, Therefore, I urge you, 
brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a, let's say these words together, living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now for me, the two most confusing words in this are living sacrifice. Why are they confusing? Does anyone know what the word oxymoron means? Yes, all right, it's something that you've learned in English and that's why you're like, yes, I do. Oxymoron is when two opposite words are put together and they come up with a new meaning. So something like act naturally. If you're acting, you're not being natural, but when the two are put together, they mean a new thing. Does that make sense? I think I've got another example here. Only choice. We all know what only choice means, but only means one, choice means multiple, but you put them together and it kind of means a new thing. Does that make sense? So to really understand how this kind of works together and why it doesn't fit together, I'm going to need two volunteers, please. Okay, um, Dan, you did a good job last time, so come on up. Uh, thank you. Um, and is, is your younger brother here, Xavier? Is Xavier here? Okay, yeah, come up. Thank you, thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. Come on. Okay, Dan, can I please get you standing here? Xavier, you can just stand. Right there. Excellent. Okay. Firstly, we're going to look at the word living. So living is doing. Another little Greek word for you that's used here is zao. Can we all say zao? Zao. So this word for living isn't just breathing, isn't just like they're kind of alive and I can see their vital signals are responsive. Living is actually doing. Living is doing. So can I please get you to just walk on the spot? Just walk on the spot. Excellent. That's beautiful. No need to overact. Keep it on. Yeah, okay, great. Okay. Living is doing. The other half is sacrifice. So can you please just lie on the ground? <laughs> Beautiful. So we've got moving and we've got sacrifice, okay? Immediately when we hear the word sacrifice, we kind of think of like the whole animal on the altar thing and like kind of death of some sort. Okay, you can just stay still, thank you. <laughs> so what does this mean? So we've got something that's like moving not just alive, but moving in life. And then we've got something over here that's obviously not moving, like very still. So how do these two words come together to make sense? One verse that I think helps is Galatians 2.20, which says, I have been crucified with Christ, and now I no longer live. I have been crucified with Christ, and now I no longer live. The verse goes on, but if we stop it there, can you notice what's happening here? It's a sacrifice, yeah? Nothing's happening, nothing's moving. I've been crucified with Christ, like Jesus dying on the cross for us. I've emptied myself of everything that I want to be, right? That's a sacrifice. So if we stop there, being a Christian is pretty still. Like we can give God everything that's inside of us, but we're not doing anything with it. Luckily, the verse keeps going. But Jesus lives in me. Here's the life part. Here's the living. Here's the doing. It's not my life that I'm living. It's Jesus' life living in and through me. So if we just get this sacrifice bit, we might have given everything to Jesus, but nothing's actually happening. Nothing's moving. But if we just do the living, if we just do the moving then it's our life that we're living and not Jesus's. Thank you, boys. You're welcome to go and take your seats. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we need both. Worship involves not just the moving, not just the sacrifice, but both. And the verse goes on. How? Oh, who knows? All right, back to Romans. So we had 
in order for us to worship, we need to be a living sacrifice. We need to be moving, and we need to have given everything to Jesus. And it goes on. It's kind of, that's like the theory. That's the idea behind it all. We don't quite understand it yet. We need something to actually like practically live this out. Because I know sometimes when I hear like living sacrifice, it's like, well, that's a nice idea. I kind of get that Jesus needs to live through me and I need to like kind of give things to God. Things need to like die inside of me and I need to live it all for Jesus. But how do we actually do that? Romans 12 verse 2 kind of spells it out for us what we can do to live this out. Verse two, do not conform to the patterns of this world. What this is saying is it is a do not, so we're not conforming. What this is saying is don't settle for the level of transformation you already have. God wants to do more in your life than what you're experiencing at the moment. The moment that we say, if culture is doing that, then it's okay. If my friend's doing it, then it's okay. If that's what people at school do, then it's okay. The moment that we do that, that is the opposite of what worship has to look like. We need to be different to what people at school are doing. We need to be different to what the normal is. Do not conform to the patterns of the world. And it keeps going. Do not conform to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Last little Greek word for tonight, metamorphou. Can we all please say that together? Metamorphou or something, yeah. What does this word sound like? Metamorphous. So there's this idea that if we're not making ourselves look like the world, if there has to be something inside of us that's different, there needs to be something that actually changes inside of us, right? That's this idea of metamorphou. This word is used two other times in the New Testament. So I think the fact that it's used here is significant. There's one other time it's used in the Gospels, and that's when Jesus goes up to the mountain and he like metamorphous, he like kind of transforms into like this God-like looking thing and he's with, the, he's with his friends on the top of the mountain and his friends are like, oh, what the, what's happening with Jesus? Like, why does he look like this? This is very strange. So there's that time. And I think the fact that it's used here as well makes us think this transformation that needs to happen is like something not just physically different about us, like people actually are going to see us and think that's not you that I'm seeing. This is actually Jesus that they're seeing when they see you. So this is this extreme metamorphosis transformation that needs to take place. And the other time that it's used in the Bible gives us a bit of a hint as to how this can happen. And we find it in the book of 2 Corinthians. It says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, and are being renewed or transformed into His image with everlasting glory, which comes from the Lord, who is spirit. All right, that was a super confusing verse, wasn't it? The key for me here is spirit. Whenever we're kind of in doubt in this verse, it kind of goes back to who is God? He is spirit. And that's how this transformation is to take place. We need to be where the spirit of God is because there is freedom Freedom from what the world looks like. Freedom from what we're experiencing now, which isn't from God. Freedom, that's what the Spirit of God gives. And the Spirit of God gives transformation so that when people see us, they don't just see us, but they see Jesus. So coming full circle, where did we start? We started with lips. 
There are some things that we say. There might be some things that we sing. And if that's all that worship is to us, there might be something more that we need to be doing. And it's got something to do with our heart. So we kiss towards God, but Jesus says, hmm, maybe just because you kiss, it's not quite worship. What's going on in here? Then we got into Romans and we looked at living sacrifice. A transformation then has to happen in our hearts. And that's what worship is.